Welcome to Sheth Marketing Academy. This lecture is on how companies create a world-class brand which is lasting. It's almost like built to last, not just as a company, but through that company, how do you create a brand reputation where the society actually takes stakeholding? They love the brand, they admire the brand. This lecture is not on product brands. If anything else, this lecture could be more corporate brand, a house brand where you are creating even in a large conglomerate with multiple unconnected businesses a common corporate brand. That's the lecture. The title of the lecture is How Great Companies Create World-Class Brands. And there are some observations I wanted to make up front. So let's see what's common between Coca-Cola William Shakespeare, the Beatles, Red Cross, Disney, Internet, Singapore, Starbucks, Tata, Apple, and Google. I've deliberately chosen these examples from brands that have just evolved by themselves, such as the Internet, or brands that have happened not by the creator of the brand, such as William Shakespeare, or brands that have been very strongly positioned, targeted, managed, such as Singapore. What a nation does, what a great playwright does, what a great innovation like internet happens or does, there's something in common among all of these. So let's look at that. They are all world-class brands that the whole world admires and loves. That's very important. In other words, very few people object to them. They've accepted them. It is a part of their daily lives. How do you make, therefore, the whole world take ownership without legal or investor ownership in the company. That's this lecture is all about. More commonly I find, as I've done research on this from the 80s surprisingly, that most of the successful corporate brands in general all have very humble beginnings when you analyze Whirlpool as a struggling company called Upton Machine Company by inventing automatic washing machines, or Maytag, or Hewlett Packard on the other hand, Mercedes Benz, Daimler Benz for example. I can give you hundreds of these corporations. When you go back to their history, they had very humble beginnings, a lot of struggles in the beginning, they were all mission driven of some sort and eventually became world class. And everybody admires them and respects for what they have done, but also they love them, which means there is a rational component and an emotional component built into creating this corporate brand. They have all risen from their humble beginnings to become world class, in other words. So what's a world-class brand? I've struggled with this definition. I can always go back to Webster's Dictionary or Wikipedia, but I don't like to simply repeat. I like to create my own definition. My definition of a world-class brand is the one which the whole world knows. That means 100% awareness, like the internet or Singapore. Whole world patronizes them, they want to do business with them, whatever business means, either as a supplier, as an employee, as a customer, uh, as a community leader. They want to engage with this brand and they love to talk about this brand in a very positive way. 
So all of the things we talk about like word of mouth communication, net promoter score that we measure companies on, impromptu comments about the companies now in the internet age on the social media, uh, reviews, uh, feedback, however we measure it, they love to talk about this brand in a positive way. There is a very, very almost non-existent negative perceptions about these brands. It is a brand that has transcended its roots from an invention, which is how most brands become in the industrial age, or from a discovery as it is happening in biological sciences right now, or the country of origin, which means they were an American brand, a Japanese brand, a Korean brand, a Chinese brand, an Indian brand, and now they have become everybody's brand. In other words, a consumer in another country does not have a positive or negative view about the brand because they come from a given country. They are able to transcend, therefore, invention as the root, discovery as the root, or country of origin. I also began to do research in this area, as I mentioned, from the 80s, and more recently have come back into the dis discipline about how do you create a corporate reputation, a corporate brand. We do have the measures of these by companies like Interbrand or Brand Finance, but they are primarily financial measures. In other words, what is the economic value of these brands? But they are not really the way I am thinking about that these brands are not just great economic value creators for the shareholders, the family ownership, or whatever it is, but they are actually totally embraced and accepted by everybody. So it's a very different perspective. The six dimensions of a world-class brand are the following. And not all brands can meet all the criteria, but they'll lean toward that. First, of course, is that these are always innovative companies. They believe in innovation. They lead the innovation quite often. And of course, the most obvious example today would be Apple, especially with the release of now the Apple 5, for example, or in the iPhone business, the Mac business, the iPod, or anything. They're always innovative, not inventive, they're innovative. There may be nothing new in terms of new technology, but they have somehow put it together and created a very viable product or service. That's what it is all about. So clearly one dimension is they're all innovative. Second dimension is that they're highly respected by the society for what they do. Even though they are a business institution, and therefore, there's always this uh, uneasiness about can we trust business, for example. Uneasiness whether capitalism really is good for the society or not, especially unchecked capitalism, or capitalism that is out of balance, out of control in some fashion. So how do you gain respect in the society, very much like religion or the faith does, for example, very much like uh, professors do in the academic world as a respected occupation, how can business and this company become highly respected? And that's the best example I can come out would be, there are many, is Tata as a group. When they began more than 100 years ago, the legacy of Tata is incredible, not just in India where the roots are, but all over the world. They're highly respected. And there are many brands like that, corporate brands, which are highly respected. But are you also loved at the same time? Respect is one thing. That may happen because you are very efficient. You are always com you know, competing against the competition. You, know, you may be that, but are you loved also at the same time? And I find on the love dimension, uh, Disney comes out. Remember, that's an emotional dimension, as I mentioned earlier, whereas respect is a rational dimension. Disney, everybody loves it. Whether you any tourist from any country when they go to Disney World in Florida or Disneyland in uh, Los Angeles or they go to Disney Europe 
Disney Euro in near Paris, or they go to Disney Asia, wherever they go, they simply like the people. They like the uh, offerings. They like the uh, setting. I mean, everything. It's very emotive, very experiential. Fourth dimension of a world-class corporate brand is they're trusted, which means they have consistency of what they do. And what is an implicit promise, not even an explicit promise, such as a claim in advertising, is actually what they deliver. They believe in that. And of course, Caterpillar comes out very well. An industrial company, their customers, both dealers as well as the end users, like construction companies, the farmers, trust Caterpillar because in any kind of a breakdown, Caterpillar will come and fix the problem which means you are economically productive. There is no downtime. And they give you actually service contracts accordingly. There was a similar reputation by Boeing, by all of the airlines the same way. They're all trusted that the aircraft will be safe, will fly properly, low maintenance, predictability. Toyota clearly goes for creates value, which is the next dimension, the fifth dimension. Toyota also has a trust dimension. Remember, these are not mutually exclusive. A brand, a world-class brand, has to do well on many of these dimensions. Toyota has learned how to create value for customers. And of course, value creation is based upon changing the processes of manufacturing, such as lean operations, which is a combination of four different processes. And the last one is that these uh, world-class brands are meaningful. In other words, they do things in their business activity where people believe what they do is good for the society also. It makes sense. People relate to that. It is almost like purpose-driven brands. They have above and beyond economic motivation. Uh, that's very interesting. And that is what the community bonds the employees bond, the customers bond, investors bond, and the suppliers bond from that perspective. As I say, this is a research that I did recently again, primarily about companies that are purpose driven. Do they financially outperform companies that are strictly shareholder driven? And that book with my colleague Rajendra Sisodia and David Wolf has become one of the better books in leadership. It conclusively shows you that companies that are purpose driven over 15 year cycle actually deliver four times the financial return consistently annually, around 42% annually, as compared to S&P 500 index, which is about 9.5% to 10% roughly. And the volatility is not that great. In other words, 42% doesn't go from like 15, 20% one year and 100% next year. It's very consistent, predictable value uh, of their companies. And by the way, S&P 500 on the other hand has become more volatile, surprisingly. And the companies, about 30 of them, out of which 18 were publicly listed, surprisingly also outperformed the Jim Collins good to great companies, about 11 of them, at least twice over 15 years with not a single bankruptcy or chapter 11, unlike Jim Collins out of 11 books, I have 11 companies, uh, two have already gone into chapter 11 protection. So why build world-class brand? What is in it? First of all, world-class brands command a premium relative to their competitors, as I just mentioned. Apple clearly leads right now. Costco is another one that basically has a better market capitalization than its immediate competitor, like a Walmart, for example. And BMW in automobile has a better valuation multiple uh, than, let's say, its competitor, like a Mercedes-Benz, or um, I would say maybe a Volvo to some extent in Europe context, and of course, the Japanese luxury brands. World-class brands transform tangible assets like people, products, money, factories into intangible equity. And the examples here are United Way, an NGO, great brand ranks among the top brands in the world. 
IBM has done a similar job. They transform IBM as an equity or a goodwill. And Coca-Cola, of course, is the famous example, especially the ratings done by Interbrand, where Coca-Cola still is about $70 billion in valuation, independent of the valuation of the business by and large. The third reason is that world-class brands appeal to all stakeholders, not just shareholders. In other words, to create a world-class brand, a corporate brand, is not just to please shareholders. You need to please all stakeholders, as I mentioned earlier, employees, customers, suppliers, community, but also media and the government. Those two additional stakeholders of media and the government are becoming equally important to relate to and a world-class company actually is appeals to all of them. They all admire and respect this company. World-class brands meet all four criteria of a resource-based advantage theory. As you know, in strategy and in competition, in economics, the literature is clearly divided. You have the typical industry competitiveness and things like what Michael Porter and his thinking have crystallized very well about that thinking to say it's all about competition, it's all about price competition, and whoever survives, very much like uh, population ecology, a Darwinian capitalism. Or on the other hand, you have an alternate theory that says it is, doesn't matter, you insulate from competition actually, you don't compete even, and that because you have a unique resource. These world-class brands tend not to even compete in the traditional sense, but actually, in fact, insulate from competition. And uh, there are four properties as articulated by scholars in the resource-based advantage. One is that they are rare, interestingly, which means only one in 100, one in 1,000 can become a world-class brand, a corporate brand. They're very valuable. We already talked about the economic value, but they're valuable to the society. They're imperfectly mobile, which means these resources cannot be transferred to somebody else, like a merger acquisition. And they are inimitable. If a, somebody likes to duplicate them, it is much harder to duplicate this resource. So how can a company and its corporate reputation have these four characteristics. So these are the areas why creating a world-class brand is very important. You know, one can immediately say it is an evolutionary process. Brands evolve. It's life cycle theory, maybe. I don't believe that thing. I do believe in Jim Collins' first book, which I think is a great book, Built to Last which means there is a managerial intervention, there is a leadership in where there is a conscious effort, there are resources allocated. It's a lot of hard work. It is not just being there to succeed or just because you invented, you become a world-class brand. There are so many inventions that have actually gone wayside and have died. There are so many discoveries and the companies made money in the short run, but they were like a meteoric rise and then fall. These brands, these companies go forever. And how great companies create world-class brand requires eight different approaches or eight different initiatives. They are what I would call success factors or critical. Uh, the first one is they all constantly freely challenge industry dogma, which means they don't believe that what succeeded yesterday or what is succeeding today is the success for the future. They don't believe in status quo. And of course, you see the industry dogma would be you cannot make products in America. It is too labor intensive. We need to outsource it to emerging economies such as China, as Nike has done. But here is new balance, which says, no, we have to actually make the products in America and still succeed. 
That is true of Southwest Airlines that began to challenge the traditional paradigm of how to price, how to organize the routes, like a hub and spoke system, and pricing almost like a, a duopoly or duopsony pricing primarily, to basically saying, how do we make it so affordable that people don't have to drive or people don't have to actually, in fact, take a bus or take a train if possible. So that's clearly freely challenge industry dogma. Second one is that they all take a stakeholder perspective consciously. They are not shareholder driven only. They are driven by everybody. And they care to create value for each of the stakeholders that I already talked about, such as employees, such as customers, and especially the community. So they believe in doing well by doing good, or what is now called shared value creation. Companies create value not only for shareholders, but also for the society. Patagonia comes out clearly in that category, almost a purpose-driven company in what they do. I have visited Kohler, which is a small town company in Wisconsin in plumbing, uh, you know, these toilet seats and that kind of a business they are in, absolutely incredible company. When you go there, you feel like you are in a small community and town by itself. Employees have their own schools there. It's a separate township. And you feel the presence of being primarily a stakeholder driven company, not a shareholder driven company. And I have found in my research that most of these companies that take a stakeholder perspective are usually private companies. They are not even listed on the stock market. And usually they are located in small towns, not in large metropolitan area where you can hide in the gated community or a country club and therefore you don't see the real world. These companies bond with everybody, with the community, with the investors, with the customers, with the employees, with the media, with the government, etc. So they take a stakeholder perspective. They all have learned third trait is that they break traditional trade-offs. So Toyota broke the trade-off quality versus cost. They came out with a more reliable car than anybody in the industry at a lower cost by simply transforming the processes with which you assemble, manufacture the car. My experience about Toyota is not what we know about the Camry and of course the luxury brand like Lexus or the Corolla, which is the best selling small car in the world. But my experience is in a safari in Africa, where what used to be a Land Rover brand usually typically was like 90% of the uh, safari vehicles were all Toyota. So you talk to the driver who is going to be there for several days with you. Why Toyota? And they said, it's very reliable. When you climb the mountain terrain, it doesn't stall. It's very fuel efficient, interestingly. So Toyota has learned how to not go for the typical trade-off that if you want superior quality, you have to pay more. Or it's going to cost more for us to create that superior quality. And Amazon has done the same thing, that the trade-off is the convenience versus the cost, trade-off is speed of delivery versus the cost. Think about the old days of the typical bookstore that we went to buy a book and we'll be told you will get the book six, eight weeks later. The bookseller will want to order the book for you from a publisher. Supply chain was so inefficient and you know it is very much like furniture we buy today. But today, Amazon says, you order it now, and you might get it in two, three days even. So there's a whole value creation they have done, which, knocks, which basically challenges the traditional approach, but also inherent trade-offs that you have that are able to resolve those trade-offs. Fourth one is that take a long-term perspective. So if you look at it in the private equity market, most of them are very short-term, five to seven years, I pick up a company at a low cost, low value company struggling. Let me come in, restructure it, strip off the assets, sell them, break them up, etc. But the real genius of private equity has been Warren Buffett. 
he invest or their company Berkshire Hathaway invest for the long haul. Staying with a given invested company for 15, 20 and longer terms. And we have seen that Warren Buffett approach to creating value really is successful. I mean, he himself is probably the second richest person in the world continuously for almost a decade now. But this is an interesting philosophy, take a long term perspective. And the same thing is true, for example, with the Tata Group in India. That's just one example. There are many other companies. As I said, mostly family run businesses often take a long term perspective because they are not buffeted by the quarterly stock market performance. And therefore, they motivate their CEOs, professional managers from that perspective. Next one is that they all favor organic growth. They are generally not for takeovers, mergers, acquisitions, and integration. So BMW so far has grown very, very well without any acquisition. I mean, they, they have bought some luxury brands, but it is not a serious acquisition. IKEA, which is another retailer, especially in the sort of the modern do-it-yourself assembly, same phenomenon. Disney, same phenomenon. They have tended to grow from within rather than make acquisitions, which they could have made otherwise. Blend the functional and emotional appeal. As I mentioned earlier, these companies seem to somehow have the play and work ethic combined. So they have the Northern European strong uh, work ethic, but they also have the casualness of the Mediterraneans. How do you blend the two together in the same organization? Uh, very much like an improvisation as opposed to uh, orchestration. They seem to do both. So it's not only the trade-off model that I talked about. They are able to break the trade-off. But they seem to believe that you must enjoy while you are working. You must enjoy while you are consuming. You must enjoy as a supplier while you are serving a customer or an OEM customer, which you are. The uh, community well, you know, it says not only you're giving us money, but we enjoy having you around. It's that kind of a mindset that comes about uh, through that combination. They invent non-traditional marketing, which I find fascinating. Being a marketing professor myself, I watch that these companies think differently. And often they become excellent companies and world-class reputation they create because they thought differently. Of course, the two companies I've listed in the presentation is CarMax, the haggling that takes place between the dealer, the sales guy, as well as the customer is just not satisfying. People hate it. They want to buy the car, they're emotionally charged up, but the process comes in the way, and therefore CarMax came out with very transparent, predictable pricing, especially for used cars, and became the largest car or retailer out of nowhere very similar to some of the chains that have emerged in uh, retailing. And Walmart, obviously, is another key case where they went into small rural markets, which everybody was thought there is no way you could market to these guys' world-class brands. But the rest is history. Walmart became the largest retailer, not Sears, not Kmart, which they emulated, actually, Kmart by going into small towns. So they invent non-traditional marketing non-traditional advertising, non-traditional distribution, all the four P's of marketing. And the last one, which I have talked about several times, is that they seem to be more purpose-driven, not just profit-driven. So they add purpose to the profit objective. Recently, with the sustainability drive, most corporations are now thinking about triple bottom line, profit, people, and planet. They are broadening the definition of what is the objective of the corporation. And there are companies like Kimberly Clark that will take on the responsibility to say, how can we motivate consumers to consume less? Or how can they make sure, because too much of this disposable product, from diapers to sanitary napkins to Kleenex or you know the typical uh, toilet tissues, for example, how do we make sure that post-consumption, 
actually is as important as a procurement, which is selling or buying and consumption. And they've taken this as a corporate responsibility. Gramin Bank, we talked about, was not just to make money on the poor by lending entrepreneurs, mostly illiterate, but also to serve a societal purpose. They almost are social enterprise. So how do you take this social enterprise mindset and the profit mindset and blend together, as Michael Porter has talked about, how do we have a shared purpose and shared value creation? So what I thought that we might do now is we have identified these eight characteristics of companies that create a world-class brand, a corporate brand. It's possible, therefore, that we engage everybody into this exercise. So on the next page, on a scale of 1 to 10, where 1 means poor and 10 means excellent, can we rate your company? And of course, one can rate the company, and the total maximum score will be 80, because each scale, you can only score from 1 to 10. And having that profile will tell which of these eight elements company is not as good as yet, and can achieve by investing more into that particular dimension, for example. Companies may be very good in general, but they have not thought about non-traditional marketing, inventing that one. So can you now put a mission statement? Can you uh, incentivize your people? Uh, can you hire agencies who will do this non-traditional marketing? Or you may have a CSR movement on the side, almost like saying that I have to contribute back to the society as I make money, like many oil companies have done. They have been always criticized at the first major energy crisis, 74 to 78. And they're also being criticized now that you are making a lot of money for the shareholders, but what are you doing for the society? So you have a CSR movement either from guilt feelings or just to counterbalance negative public opinion or to make sure that the governments will still continue blessing you. It says, no, that's not acceptable. Is the purpose of the company itself is redefined from strictly profit uh, motive to basically a social motive in addition to a profit motive. So one can improve on that one and what process can you put in the company. So let me summarize this lecture. Building a world-class brand is key to increasing corporate life expectancy. I'm amazed with the data that if you take the Fortune 500 companies, or if you take the FTSE 500, which is a London stock exchange companies, or if you take the German stock exchange or the uh, French stock exchange, the average life expectancy of a corporation now has declined to under seven years. FTSE is down to four and a half years. Germany is a little more, but as industries restructure themselves to survive and to grow, these world-class companies continue their journey forever. So it increases life expectancy, just like we can increase human life expectancy with proper diet and exercise and a constantly doing things in moderation, I think the same thing companies can do. A world-class brand is universally loved by everyone. It transcends the cultures, inventions, discovery, and country of origin. There are both economic and social benefits in creating world-class brands, which means they serve a social cause and as well as an economic profit motive. So this capitalism versus socialism is a just a arbitrary debate. We love to create duality in the Western thinking as if only two extremes matter, as opposed to saying, how do we blend the socialism with capitalism, for example? It's very possible. Who say that the social mission is only by NGOs and by governments in this tripod model of a society, and the business mission is only profit. In fact, all three stakeholders must have 
a business mission. Even an NGO cannot survive without making sure that it is run like a business discipline with efficiency, accountability, etc. So should be the government, should have a business perspective. But business at the same time must have also a broader societal perspective. Building a world class brand requires long term perspective, my view. It is not like building a house, a track home, assembling on the site in six weeks, as most hotels and motels are built nowadays. And it requires constantly challenging industry dogma. In fact, in one other book that I have written, Why Good Companies Fail, the title of the book is called Self-Destructive Habits of Good Companies. I found again and again that companies that fail are those who are either unable or unwilling to change as the environment has changed. They are not adaptive. And like the Darwinian theory in some fashion, it is only the adaptive that survive. It is only, only the adaptive that grow, etc. And the same idea here that the company needs to constantly challenge whatever prevailing wisdom they have, including the one they created themselves. It also requires balancing interest of different stakeholders, which I have hammered away the point many times. That includes employees, customers, supporters, and community. Actually, it's suppliers more than just the supporters, but you can have supporters, which is also possible. World class brands are innovative, respected, loved, trusted, and meaningful to all stakeholders. Thank you very much. <laughs>